Okay, this is what we've done in love. We need to kind of concentrate on love and ethics because <clears throat> try to absorb this material because we're almost through. So we only have a few more shots at getting love in your heart and you won't ever love anybody if you don't do that. So we've looked at, this is our study of love divided up into pretty much three divisions. <clears throat> Concepts and attempted definitions that was way back to the very beginning. Secular dictionary and, and Christian dictionary attempted definition of just what love is. Then we did a statistical study of the Greek terms, beginning with, um, I think, storge and going all the way through, the, through agapao, which was like three messages, I think, that did record, and then a fourth one that didn't record, but we did four studies. And then thirdly, <coughs> that gives us an introduction to what love is, the concepts and definitions uh, that people have attempted to place upon the subject of love and we know what the Greek ter terms are and then topics and passages it seems like whenever the New Testament is is addressing love it addresses it in one of three different ways first of all there's all of those references that are quotations of that passage in Leviticus love thy neighbor as thyself there are like nine different places in the New Testament where that passage is quoted and so what we discussed there, love thy neighbor as thyself, was neighbor love. We've got neighbor love out of that. We got enemy love out of that because we got jumped back into Matthew 5. We looked at concepts of neighbor and enemy. Who is my neighbor or whose neighbor am I? We found out from Luke 10 in the parable of the certain Samaritan. Enemy, love thy neighbor as thyself. And what does that last phrase mean? We got into self-love as a result of that. Many passages in the New Testament that speak about love <clears throat> are something in this context right here. Those that aren't could be in one of the other two, and many of them are in this new commandment, especially in John. But I think Paul may even have a reference or so in there as well. When he speaks about in, what is it, 1 Timothy 1, 5, now the end of the law, the end of the commandment is this. What's the first thing? Love out of a pure heart. You know, the end of the law, the end of the commandment is this. The new commandment of John 13, 34, and 35. First of all, it being a commandment, can you command moral good out of a person and it be rendered and, and still be given from their heart and not just in duty in response to this commandment? The newness of it, and put an L in there, the result of it. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. And so we've been looking at the last couple of weeks the subject of Christian brotherhood, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now that's interesting because we should think of that, we should practice that here. He said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples. Yeah. And I think we're going to even see more why as we get into our third and final area this morning. Because we're going to move beyond it being a new commandment and these three aspects of it. And by the way, whenever we get down here to our third one, I think I won't have three aspects anymore, but we'll study that. I think we'll be through with it here probably in one study. It's a big, it's a big topic, and that, of course, concerns love and the law. And I think he's referring to capital L, law. And then if you want to give us um, four, we'll look at conclusions. That's how I have tried to present my understanding of love to you, is under these four points here. Now, you may have never thought of it this way before, <coughs> and probably you don't, or we don't, unless we, unless we try to do some, system, some type of systematic study of it. You wouldn't even um, be knowledgeable of the fact, would never have probably entered your mind, that whenever you're coming across love in the New Testament, it's probably going to be under one of these three type headings here. Now, not always, but probably. Or it's going to be just some general reference to love that you can't really put under one category or the other. But if you want to take a look at those 500 times in the New Testament where the noun or the verb, love, the high form, the agapao, agape, where that occurs, it's interesting that when it's talking about, in, in other words, if it just makes some little reference to, you know, um, I heard of your faith and your love of the Lord Jesus. Well, that's just kind of like a general reference to love. If you want to hear about it in some interesting category, it'll, it'll be in one of those three categories there. A neighbor love, which brings in enemy, which brings in as thyself, self-love, 
a new commandment, this is a commandment, or love and the law. And by that I mean those references, and I will give them to you here in a moment, where Paul or someone else, James, speaks of love in some relation to the law, such as love is the fulfilling of the law. Now that's outside of the confines of neighbor love and new commandment. Now it's love and the law. And it would seem to me that our first and immediate reaction would be uh, love is the antithesis to the law. You know, the law is binding and love is free. It seems like the law speaks of the Old Testament and love speaks of the New Testament. A and we would see a disparity between the two. But yet we would know if we know Scripture in the New Testament, on the other hand, that the Apostle Paul speaks of there being uh, a relationship between the two when he speaks of love being the fulfilling of the law. Or he that hath loved another, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And we know how important fulfilling the law is. Maybe we don't know in what sense Paul has reference to it, but it has to be important. Unless we're some of those who just a totally reprobate anti-nomian, anti-Old Testament framework in our mind where we just think law is just, you know, mosaic and dead and nailed to the cross and all of this, there, there's another sense in which it must not be. If Christ himself said in Matthew chapter 5, I've not come to destroy but to fulfill, yeah. then it's interesting that Paul speaks of the Christian's fulfilling of the law as well. Matthew 5, I've not come to destroy but I've come to fulfill. Not a jot or tittle will pass away. Uh, until heaven and earth pass away. I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill, Matthew 5, 17 and 18. And then Paul speaks of the Christians fulfilling of the law. So that, to me, I would, it would alert me that there must, there, there's something going on here. There's some type of connection, maybe even between what was said or what Jesus said of himself and what Paul said is to be true of us. All right, let's look at some passages. Let me give them to you first of all. The biggest one, the best known one, is Romans 13. Verses 8 through 10. Another uh, big one is Galatians 5, verses 14 and 23, and then chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Uh, James 2, 8. <clears throat> and then I think you also could add in there Matthew 7, 12. 1 Timothy 1.5 plus all those passages in the Gospels where Jesus speaks of the two great commandments. And we gave you those texts earlier under neighbor love because those are the ones that are quoting the Leviticus 19.18 uh, passage. So I, don't, I would have to look them up. Maybe I better do that so you've got all your scriptures down. Because that's speaking of, of love in, in the sense of commandments because he's going back to, to Old Testament law there. Hmm, let's see. I don't think that one applies. Matthew 19, 19, 22, 39, Mark 12, 31, and 33, uh, Luke 10, 27, Okay, and listen to what the last three are here. You've already got them. Romans 13, 9, Galatians 5, James 2. And then I even had a note here. Uh, I said, we'll deal with the setting of Matthew 5, <clears throat> 43 later, the one I just, I didn't give you right then. That's because that fits under enemy love, and we separated that. Then I said, Romans 13, 9, Galatians 5, 14, and James 2, 8, deal with the law. And we'll see that when we come to the topic of law, which is where we are right now this morning. This was in a message entitled, <laughs> Jesus Teaching on Neighbor Love. And then I said Matthew 19 is the same account as Mark 10, but the latter omits the neighbor reference. Um, so we'll study uh, the other one instead of that one. Leaves us with Matthew 22, Mark 12, and Luke 10, which is a similar but different account. So that gives you all the scriptures, but the three big ones are, and the biggest, the heavyweight is the Romans 13, behind that Galatians 5, uh, verse 14, 23, 6, 1 to 2, and James, the second chapter in the eighth verse, where he speaks of something that he mystically refers to as that royal law, but he never tells us what it is, that royal law. Then let's look at Matthew 7, 12, and 1 Timothy 1, 5, before we even begin 
Matthew 7, 12, 1 Timothy 1, 5, so we'll know what they say. They're not using all the words that we're going to find in these other passages, so I don't think we'll do a study of them in particular. But what is said of the others will relate to them insofar as they themselves relate to the other passages. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Say, well, why look this up? It doesn't even mention the word love. Yes, but one thing about love, one crucial thing about love is that love is active. Love is not a special way of feeling. Love says things, does things. Love is active. And what's this verse speaking about? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, and here's where I think the emphasis falls, do ye even so to them. Many of us have many good thoughts, and they're never carried out in the action of our feet or our hands. And he said, your good thoughts are not enough. He said, whatever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even also to them. Christianity is a do religion. Not a do of good works, but a doing in the performance of Matthew 7:12. So there's love right there. I mean, I think that you, o you would only do good things for other people if you love them. I don't think the reason is the Nietzsche reason that where well, you do good things to others knowing that in return that's going to force them psychologically to do good things for you. I don't think that's the stress of what Jesus is saying at all. As a matter of fact, I know it's not. Uh, even if they don't do anything good for you, the commandment is still do good unto them. There's love. Where's the relation to the law? We'll look at the conclusion. This is the Old Testament. Isn't law and prophets just a neat summation of old? This is the Old Testament. Amen. And we thought it was sacrifice, prophets, mosaic law. No, nope. we were wrong. We Love, he said. I think that's what he's talking about here in this verse. This is the Old Testament. The Old Testament is love. So to go back to our first problem of an antipathy, you know, existing between one and the other, the Old Testament and love. We think of Old Testament as being law and New Testament being love. Well, Jesus himself refutes that. He said, this is the law and the prophets. What is? The doing of good to others. And what, what compels, what motivates one to act like that? Love. This is the Old Testament love. Okay, 1 Timothy 1.5. That's an important passage. 1 Timothy 1.5. Now, this is the end of the commandment. Does NIV or something give goal of our instruction or something? Goal of what? Of, of his... This command. I've, I've read other translations. The goal of our instruction. Does anyone have that in a translation? The goal of our instruction? NESB? Maybe it's in that. You think it's in that? Um... Oh, I see what they're saying. I, I was going to say, I don't know about that because that instruction, um, I don't know, somehow it's not related to the law. You know, commandment, um, entole is a Greek term here. Commandment somehow connects me and my thinking to the law. Goal of our instruction, maybe it's just New Testament doctrine, New Testament teaching instruction, you know. And so it's not connected to the law. You say, why, why do we need law on here? Well, look at the context. From which some, some having swerved have turned aside to vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, the normals, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law, I mean, he's all talking about the law here. So I think we need commandment back here, unless you're meaning by instruction, instruction in the Old Testament commandment. Now, the end of the commandment, or a goal, I think, is a better word, because end, could, end is an ambiguous term. We don't know what that means, but end could mean goal. Like, um, my end purpose in taking this job is, what do you mean by your end? Well, my goal in doing this is, not that I'm going to stop or something. We think of end to stop, but end can have another meaning. It's an ambiguous term. It can mean goal. The goal of the commandment. In other words, he's saying the goal of this law that he's going to talk about here in the next few verses. In other words, the Matthew 7, 12, the goal of the Old Testament. And what's the first thing is love, charity. You know, we see we got that. The Vulgus got that. We got that from that as well. Love out of a pure heart, then a good conscience, and then faith unfaint. Love out of a pure heart. So I think there is a relationship between love as it's taught in the New Testament, the Old Testament law. 
Okay, let's begin with the heavyweight, uh, Romans 13. <clears throat> and I really trust that the Lord will teach us all some things through this Amen. this morning. Amen. It won't be just an academic exercise, but we will actually learn some things uh, to the point of um, striving to obey them and do them. <clears throat> Romans 13. Very interesting chapter. A short chapter, as you notice. Uh, I think it's got three divisions in it. The first seven verses, you know, speak of authorities. Eight to ten speaks of love. And eleven to fourteen speaks of walking um, walking in the light. Because we're children of the light. I think those are three uh, clearly seen divisions here in the chapter. So the, the first, uh, well, what, the first half, seven verses, yes, half. The first half, verses 1 to 7, spoke of duties to government. Higher powers, I think he means government here, although it can be applied in other areas. First half of this chapter spoke of duties to government. Now in verses 8 through 10, I think he speaks of our duty to all men. That may perhaps be the connection, in other words. I mean, if you've ever read through this and kind of thought to yourself, how did he go from obedience to presidents and kings into talking about love? What's the connection there? Well, it's hard to see, but maybe the connection is he's, he's talking about duties, Christian duties. And he went from duties of the Christian to his government to duties of the Christian to all men. And that's why we get down into love in the next three verses. Verses 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. There's our first phrase. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and this fourth one should probably be stricken out textually. Thou shalt not bear false witness. I think there's only four thou shalt nots instead of five here. So we'll strike thou shalt not bear false witness out. So we only have four. And the fourth one, which is their fifth one, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, which would take care of false witness as well. So we don't need to slip all of them in there to make sure we didn't leave any of them out. Uh, because Paul takes care of that himself. If there be any other commandment, commandment, we're back to intellect, uh, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, there's one of those neighbor passages that I said we wouldn't look at under neighbor, we'd look at under law because it fits here in the context of law and not neighbor. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Now I think he goes on to responsibilities in the moral realm toward God. The night is far spent, duties, that is, toward God. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That happened to be the verse right there that converted uh, Augustine. Yeah, he's got an interesting checkered history. You know, he was a, if anyone was a wanton man, it was Augustine in his youth. He kept mistresses left and right and had children born by them and, and the whole time struggling with what are, what are final answers, you know? He was a brilliant, brilliant young man. Finally ended up with an appointment to teach in Rome, and finally someone else secured an appointment for him to teach in um, Milan, which is where he heard Ambrose, the preacher. And the fellow who had discipled Ambrose into the faith, who was even maybe uh, more to the point in his preaching uh, to Augustine than Ambrose had been, got Augustine so confused about his Neoplatonic thoughts and his Manichaeism that he had to surrender all of that. He said, those things don't hold answers. 
and he was searching for what would hold an answer. And as the story goes, and we don't know how much of it is true, but the part that Romans 13 and verse 14 plays, and it seems to be relatively secure in history, was he was sitting in a garden one day, and he heard a child's voice. He thought it was a small angel, I think, but he heard a child's voice um, say, pick up and read. And he found a Bible and snatched it up, and through the hunt and peck method, which sometimes not that reliable because you might end up with the passage of Judas going out and hanging himself and think you're supposed to do that. But then again, if God's working, I think even in your life, I think even the hunt and peck method will work. <laughs> and in other words, what Augustine really needed was Romans 13, these last few verses there. He was a rowdy boy, very brilliant, but very rowdy in the area of lust and sexual uncleanness and impurity. He just couldn't seem to ever get rid of that and didn't know how you could get rid of things like that. And so the hunt and peck method, I think he flipped through the Bible and Romans 13 fell open and he saw verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And then he probably jumped back and saw verse 13 too. Not in rioting or drunkenness, chambering or wantonness, and that was certainly a picture of Augustine as a young man. Not in strife and envy. So Romans 13 has had an important history in the development of the church with a man like Augustine being converted from its pages. But we're not looking at those last verses, <laughs> important as they are and as interesting as they may seem. We're looking at verses 8, uh, 9, and 10. Owe no man anything, and I think that connection of owe no man anything, um, or the connection of that owe no man anything, is to verse 7 with um, paying the various types of taxes, the two taxes that are mentioned here in verse 7. Owe no man anything, in other words, pay your taxes. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Okay, this little, I think it's been the general practice to take this little phrase, but to love one another, as an exception clause to what preceded. And we use these type of exception clauses all the time, and I think that's probably what we have taking place here. You know, we use it all the time. You can think of any example you want to. Um, I will never come over your house again unless, and then we just tear down our word never, because never is a big term, and it's a long one as well. And it means we'll never do it. But then as soon as you say unless, then you qualified never. And I guess that's okay to do because Paul said, don't owe any man anything. And then he said, but, <laughs> all right, that just destroyed, don't owe any man anything. There is one debt here, and he said that's the debt of love. That's been the general practice, I think, of interpreting this verse. Um, I guess right now, I guess I feel fairly secure with that, with that method. See, there are other ways to look at it, but I suppose that's probably the best way that I understand in my thinking right now is to see this but to love one another as what we would call an exception clause here, where it qualifies the first half of the sentence, owe no man anything, and then it qualifies that, but I'll let you owe him one thing. And then he goes on and enumerates uh, what that is. He says love, finally, is the only allowable unpaid debt but to love one another. Love is the only allowable unpaid debt. Other debts, sooner or later, hopefully, you eventually pay them off. You see, that's the whole point in this. Other debts, you eventually pay off. You may have a debt, but you're going to pay it off, hopefully, eventually. And I think that's the whole contrast here with the doctrine of love because anyone who's in debt again hopefully i keep qualifying with hopefully some people just love to be in debt for the sake of being in debt and hope they die and never have to pay anything off and leave no surviving relatives you know <clears throat> but i think most people who are in debt have a hope for the future that one day they won't be in debt anymore and that's going to come about as a result of hard work and paying off that debt but what he, is, what he is guarding and arguing against here is that type of mentality with regard to the Christian concept and virtue of love. And unless you think this is just um, academia, what, what we're looking at here, <clears throat> I think we probably all have thought that thought before. That, you know, I'm just going to do a few more things for this person. I think finally I'll, I'll have my debt paid. I, th I know I thought that way. I, now, I'm going to love them a little bit more. You know, in other words, you're dealing with it like you're dealing with your own financial debt, 
you have a hope for the future that eventually you would have paid this bill off. That it'll be signed, stamped at the bottom, paid in full. That you would have paid this debt in full to this person. And I think that's what he's arguing against here. We all have this hope for the future that if we're in debt right now, that we're, we're going to try to get out of it and eventually we're going to get out of it. And so then we carry that over. We carry that right over to love. And Paul's brilliant in the way he draws these things, draws debts and love together. It's a brilliant drawing, and then draws the law onto the end of it. Three things here, debt and love and law. It's a brilliant drawing together of them all. Because I think as human beings, we sometimes look at others as having a hope for our relationship with them in the future of having discharged fully um, this debt of love. Because we deal with it as we deal with any other type of debt. It's something that eventually will be payable. There, there is X amount. I mean, even if we add on 18% interest a year, there's still X amount. 18% is still 18%. It's not 97%. It's still 18%. And so even if we want to add on 18% of love per year, if I, can, you know, if I can keep knocking off the principal and start attacking that interest as well here, or really knock off the interest and then start attacking that principal now, then eventually, even if it takes me a few years, I'll knock that debt of love off. And Paul's saying, no. When you think about that, he's saying, no. That is false, fallacious reasoning. Think that you're going to attack the interest and finally get to the principle and then knock that principle off as well. He says, no. I think that's the meaning here. It's an exception clause. It qualifies the first thing, oh, no man, anything. And I think the oh, no man, anything is connected, as I've already said previously, to verse 7 when he's speaking of taxes there. Pay your taxes. Don't be a part of some of those renegade groups out there in America today who don't pay. Oh, no man, anything, an exception clause, statement of qualification, um, but to love one another. Now, the word another there, um, oh, the second phrase, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. That, that word another can also mean the other. Other. So it could equally, equally um, read or be translated the second part of this verse. Um, he hath fulfilled the other law. For he that loveth another, see, I think we're thinking that means another person. For he that loveth another person hath fulfilled the law. It could equally be translated, um, uh, he hath fulfilled the other law. For he that loveth hath fulfilled the other law. Now make sure you see what I'm saying there. For he that loveth, if we can translate this word another as the other and rearrange the sentence order, we would have as follows. For he that loveth hath fulfilled um, the other law. Just rearrange your words there. For he that loveth hath fulfilled the other law. And, and that's given in some translations. For he that loveth hath fulfilled the other law. All right, then we'd ask ourselves the question, what is the other law? Probably the first commandment. The second commandment is to love um, one another. Verse 8, oh, no man anything but to love one another. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. And what's the first commandment? The other law is to love God. So it could mean if you love your brother, if you love another, then you also fulfill the other law, according to 1 John 4. If you love God, you love your brother. In 1 John 5, if you love your brother, you love God. Or vice versa. I think I mixed those up. But the end of 1 John 4 and beginning of 1 John 5. For he that hath fulfilled the second commandment in loving his neighbor as himself, that man hath also fulfilled the other commandment, the other law, which is the first commandment, which is love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So after saying all that, however, I don't think that's the correct translation. <laughs> I think what we have here is better, but I wanted to make you aware of it and make it sound so interesting that I'd catch your attention before I would discard it. I think this is what we have in the KJV is better of a translation. 
and your good translations and good commentators will follow this. So, we leave it like we have it. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. We're just going to look at the verses before we get back to what's he talking about when he says that he that loves another, I think he means another person there, hath fulfilled the law. Okay, verse 9 then. Verse 9 just corroborates this by four examples. Four instead of this five that we have here, striking out their fourth one and turning their fifth into our fourth. Striking out, in other words, thou shalt not bear false witness. Four examples from the second table of the law. What do we have here? Adultery, murder, theft, and covetousness. Now that could be a study in itself. Why did Paul pick those four? Why don't we go back to, I don't think we want to do that study this morning, but why don't we go back to Exodus 20 now that I mentioned it. It got me curious in it about it as well. Exodus chapter 20. Verse 9 corroborates um, verse 8 by four examples from the second table of the law. Four examples being adultery, murder, theft, and covetousness. For the continuation of the... Four examples being adultery, murder, theft, and covetousness. Because, see, what you get into is a whole discussion here of how the law was set up on these tables. Weren't there two tables involved, ta two tablets? You think? I'm asking you. Wasn't that, wasn't that right? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I trust in you people. I'm depending on you. And weren't they written on the front and the back? Okay, if you got ten, how does, that, how does four divide into that then? you got ten commandments, you got two fronts and two backs, then which of the commandments went on the front of the first table? See what I'm saying? Two and a half of them. Two and a half on the back, two and a half on the front of the second, two and a half on the back. That's what I didn't want to get into. There's a big discussion over that. But I, <laughs> I thought I would again make you aware of all of these juicy things that the Bible has to speak about. I mean, there must be some answer, but we may have to discover those tablets broken ones and put it all back together maybe but that'd be interesting we ought to hunt over there somewhere around sinai and look for that broken tablet be a couple of them but the way he threw them with that type of anger there's probably not much left of them though so without getting into that too much um we've got what verse three thou shalt have no other gods before me all right that's the first commandment and the second one you shall not make any graven image all right, uh, verse 7 is the third one. Uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And verse 8, the fourth one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then here's another one of the problems of division. But I think this might hold the key to it, though, is that they're not divided equally five, five, five toward God and five toward your fellow man. They're divided four, six four toward God and six toward your fellow man. The first four deal with God. No false gods, no graven image, don't take his name in vain and keep his seventh day holy. All right, and then starting with verse 12, now it's relating to people entirely and not to God anymore. So it's a four, six. I think most of us just in our mind think of five, five. We're always trying to half things. We're mathematically minded, half them. We got five on this tablet and five on that. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, the fifth. Uh, thou shalt not kill, the sixth. Thou shalt not commit adultery, the seventh. Thou shalt not steal, the eighth. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, the ninth. Thou shalt not covet, the tenth. Okay, and then, and then what do we have here? We've got adultery, um, the way Paul lists them, adultery, murder, theft, and covetousness, which according to what we'd have in Moses' order here, um, would have the murder, adultery, theft, skip number nine, covetousness, and our number nine, false witness, and would have covetousness in, in verse 17, which would give us six, seven, eight, and ten. Those are the four out of the ten commandments listed in Romans 13 and verse nine. 
6, 7, 8, and 10. Now perhaps you can see why that ninth one slipped into a manuscript over here in Romans 13, 9. I mean, you're on a roll. 6, 7, 8. Why skip 9 and go to 10? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And give us 5 over there instead of our 4. So strike 9 out. Oh, now, the, why we turned over here was in asking ourselves the question that we don't even intend on answering this morning. Uh, what made Paul choose these? I mean, I think we can understand rather readily why he didn't choose one through four, because that relates to God. Probably we could understand uh, that fifth commandment, because that's just, you know, children and parents. That's not general enough. That's just children and parents there. So he's going to take these really broad ones that would speak of the whole community of people. Six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And so why did he skip nine then? Uh, that's interesting, and I don't know that anyone has a final answer on that, but there are various guesses. One of the guesses is, um, textually, we should just leave it in there because it makes more sense to leave it in there than to take it out. And I would grant that. It does make more sense to leave it in and take it out. Um, and that's one of the rules of textual criticism. You take the more difficult of the two things, if the manuscripts allow that or insist on that. And they seem to insist on this. And it's the more difficult taking that ninth one out, the fourth one in Paul's list, the ninth one here in Moses' list, because it makes more sense since you're on a roll when you start with six to hit it all the way to ten then. And yet he drops out number nine. Anyway, I just wanted you to see how those are set up and where, where those are found. It takes four examples from the second table of the law. And we're assuming that it's the second table of the law now. But four examples from the second table of the law, adultery, murder, theft, and covetousness. Okay, he says, for this thou shalt not commit adultery, kill, steal, or covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, or in this commandment, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, I think Paul is establishing here uh, the principle that Scripture interprets Scripture. And he's even doing it for the Old Testament, uh, which was the great uh, discovery of the Reformers. Their principle of hermeneutics was Scripture interprets Scripture. Or to say it in a little more developed fashion, um, the more difficult passages are to be interpreted by those more easy to understand. You don't start with the difficult ones. You start with the easy ones. If we know that Jesus is Lord, that God is one, but that God has Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, all those are just taught and taught and taught and taught. And then when it says, I and my Father are one, that's one of the more difficult passages then. That has to be interpreted in light of those which are more easy to understand and to interpret. So he's saying that you interpret this thou shalt not business more positively in a thou shalt. That was one of our interesting topics way back early in ethics, the emphasis of Old Testament and New. The Old Testament was a thou shalt not, but I said on that tape or those tapes, not exclusively so. There were some shadows of and thou shalt. In other words, something positive instead of just negative. When you hear something negative all the time, what does it do? It tends to repress you and suppress you and depress you. When you're always telling your child, don't, 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 it's good to tell them what they can do. Everyone gets tired of being told what they can't do or what they did wrong all the time. You need to mix that with some opposite of what you did right or what you can do. The Old Testament did that. It, it, it made an advance in that area. It began to say, thou shalt. And we come to the New Testament, equally so, likewise. It doesn't always say, thou shalt. It has some negatives and says, thou shalt not. So these people that make this hard and fast and, and permanent line of demarcation between the old and the new are simply doing it unwarrantedly because the old says thou shalt not but thou shalt the new testament says thou shalt but thou shalt not they're both found there i think it's a matter of emphasis but paul being an apostle of grace and writing in this dis dispensation uh, i think very interestingly enough and correctly so is going back to those thou shalt not negatives and interpreting them in light of a thou shalt thou shalt not 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 four of those he said these are briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt, no knots now, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So he transformed all those negatives into something positive. 
thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself um, is, in other words, the more broad of the categories listed here. In other words, you could um, commit adultery and yet not steal. You could commit one of those, break one of those laws and not break the other one. And so it takes a lot more space to say you shall not. And as soon as you start a rule book, there's almost no end to it, as we've discussed before. As soon as you start a rule book, there's almost no end to it. Something's going to have to be clarified later on. You just have to say you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. But, and I'm getting ahead of the story, but if you just sum it all up in some way, you've got to find what is the way it can be summed up in so that there'll never be an exception to this. There'll never be a new cultural advancement that will relegate all this to the past of Israel's ancient antiquity. And I think Jesus does that for us, and I think Paul is just following what he taught. But anyway, we'll come back to that. After going from the negative to the positive, now jump down to verse 10. Paul uses a negative statement. I think to correspond with the beginning of verse 9, to set it in its Old Testament setting of a thou shalt not. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Now, he could have made, written a positive statement and said the same thing, that love does good to his neighbor. That would be the same thing as saying love does no ill to his neighbor. Why did he put it in the negative form then? I think just... You know, whenever you're writing and you're a good writer, sometimes you try to make one statement or paragraph correspond, relate somehow to another. I think he's relating this to the negative emphasis of the first part of verse 9. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. But you see, love is more than just not doing. Love is more than just a refraining from evil. I think that's the whole point here, that he's going to then go on and, and say in this next statement in verse 10. And we've looked at that in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Love is more than just refraining from evil. And be sure you follow that. Love is more than just not doing. Love is in doing. Certainly it's in not doing. But it's more than in not doing. Love is in in doing as well. Just refraining from, well, I don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with women who do. Well, that may be love. You love God, and so you don't do those things. But what do you do in their place? Do you envy and criticize and backbite and fill with jealousy? Well, then you are do doing some things that are evil as well. Love has to be a refraining from that which is evil and a performing of that which is good. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. There's the negative part of it. Love doesn't do this. And I think he means for us to see what he's saying there and to major on that. Love doesn't do any ill toward his neighbor. Because sometimes you could get caught up just in the positive side of it so much. Love does good. Love does good. You start doing good. And you don't recognize that you're also doing some ill toward your neighbor as well in other areas. But because you think positively all the time, it's you're doing, doing, doing. You don't think of those few times where love is working ill toward one's neighbor. So in other words, just like the Old as well as the New Testament, I think we have to have a balance there. I think we have to, bo have, to have both of them. Love doesn't do and love does do. Love is a thou shalt not. But love is more than that. It's more than that. It's certainly not any less than a thou shalt not. But I think a love is more than that. Love is a thou shalt. And here's a thou shalt. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. It not only does not do evil, but it does much good. Love is the fulfilling of the law. In other places in Romans, fulfilling is translated as fullness. Romans 11.12 and Romans 11.25 and Romans 15.29. Fulfilling is translated as fullness. Love is the fullness of the law. Romans 11, 12, 11, 25, 15, 29. So I think it's obvious to say it in a sentence what is being expressed here. Love is the sum of the law. And to love is to keep the law. Love is the sum of the law. 
He said in verse 8, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. In verse 10, love is the fulfilling or the fullness of the law. Love is the sum of the law, and to love is to obey the law or to keep the law. Now see how that corresponds then with the same apostles' teaching in the same book, the 8th chapter and the 4th verse. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Same phrase. We fulfill the law, the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And that little descriptive phrase is to be found in verse 4, although not in the first verse of this chapter. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. I think part of the righteousness of the law is thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. That's a righteous declaration of God's eternal moral standards. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. As has something to do with walking after the spirit here, not after the flesh. And we know, according to Paul's teachings, that Christians themselves can walk after the flesh. They're not, they're not allowed of God to. They may not, but they can. It's possible for them to do it without God's check of approval upon it. So I think that the righteousness of the law is summed up in love then. We're going to go kind of deep this morning. We need to go rather quickly as well, I think. I think that the righteousness of the law is summed up in love. I don't think I've ever said that before. We've studied Romans 8, 4 from another perspective. That's why I'm trying to emphasize it. The righteousness of the law is summed up in love. Okay, let's jump over to Galatians and look at <clears throat> Paul's teaching there. Galatians chapter 5. We'll begin with verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. I think this this is just one of the most fascinating topics to me in the Bible is law and grace, Amen. is um, liberty and obedience. Amen. Just a really fascinating topic. And it's certainly popping up everywhere in the New Testament as well. And it's one not that easy to difficult, not, not that easy to deal with e either. It, it's rather difficult. Only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And I think then when he said love, now, it's the same train of thought, although Galatians is written prior to Romans. Uh, we'll pretend like it wasn't since Romans comes first. We'll say he's looking back to Romans, but maybe in Romans he's looking back to Galatians. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Now, he didn't say it exactly like that over in, in Romans 13. And, the, and so what people do, they, they get into this and say, now, it's a little bit different here than over there. Well, any good writer writes with variation, though. <laughs> you don't want to become monotonous by saying the same thing over and over. He said over there, if there be any other commandment, it's, it's comprehended in this saying. That's the same as saying all the laws fulfilled in one word, in this saying. And then he goes on not to give us one word. He gives us a whole sentence in, doesn't he? Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, what's the one word he's talking about, though? Love. All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And if we get down to that fruit passage of the Spirit is love, and it begins with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. Have you ever wondered, asked yourself, what does that last phrase mean? I memorized it that way. Against such there is no law. But I memorized it so quickly, I don't know if I know what I'm saying. Against such there is no law. And yet he's connecting love to the law. 
He said, love is the fulfillment, uh, verse 14. The law is fulfilled in one word, love. Love is the fulfillment, the fulfilling of the law. And yet there's no law against love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, or temperance. Against these, there's no law. Some churches would like to pass some laws against our joy every now and then, make us shut up, or against our faith in God, but, but against this, there's no law. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, I think this was the other section I gave in Galatians. Ye which are spiritual, uh, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, I think bear ye one another's burdens is the New Testament way of the Old Testament quote, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I think they're exact same thing. That, because he just gave us that quote in verse 14 of chapter 5. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Bear ye one another's burdens. If anything, this one another would be more restricted to the Christian community, perhaps, than just neighbor. But the meaning is still precisely the same. And so fulfill the law of Christ. There's always this play on law in Paul's writings. And it's difficult to nail it all down because rarely in one large section when he moves to another does he mean the precise same thing. There's a different shade of meaning with law. Does law mean, you know, um, uh, constitutional makeup of humankind? Does it mean Moses' law? Does it mean moral good? Does it mean Christ's law in contradistinction to something else such as Moses' law? You know, so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, uh, jump back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Same phrase is not found here identically, but one similar is. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 21. To them that are without law as without law being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Under the law to Christ. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6.2. Well, he uses the same word fulfill as he did with the Old Testament law in Galatians 5.14. Bear you one, another, one another's burdens, now he says, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, I think that the, the law of Christ is, is John 13, verses 34 and 35. This is my law, that ye love one another as I have loved you, even that ye love one another. Amen. This is my law. It's a different word, intellect, commandment, normal law. This is my law. This is my commandment. I think that is the law of Christ. What's the footnote to? Oh, it's to James. Someone have a different footnote or a cross-reference, rather? besides to James. We'll look at James here next. We'll be turning to that here in just a moment. Now, the law of Christ here in 1 Corinthians 9, 21, I think is obviously the law of love, which is the law laid down by Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 13 and verse 34. Now, Galatians is similar to Romans 13 teaching. This entire section shows how practical love is to be in the church. Because he goes on in verse 15, which I didn't read, if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So it's dealing with how practical love is to be in the church. And this phrase, I think we probably need to deal with this before moving on into James' epistle. Uh, verse 23b, against such there is no law. I think we need to understand it something like this. Remember in the Old Testament, various laws were given, but then another law would be given which would make a, a stipulation to the earlier law or a qualification to it, or it would modify it somehow. In other words, the Old Testament says don't kill, but then it also says that if someone blasphemes the name of the Lord, that man shall be killed by stoning. 
So one law would be given and then another law would be given to, to check or to balance that earlier law. When it comes to the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, as well as other things aren't, which aren't listed here, uh, I don't think that, that there's any other law that can control these because no law is as lofty as these. And particularly with him beginning with love, and I think that's the context of all of this, not so much the other things enumerated here, but from 5, you know, 13, right on through chapter 6, what is he talking about? Love. Against such there is no law, particularly against love. There can be no law because there's no law as lofty or more perfect than love or these other qualities, and therefore there's nothing else that can require anything more out of you than these things right here. So there's no law against this. There's no law at all because there's nothing that can demand or require more out of you than what you already have to deliver based on love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so forth. There's nothing else that is as high and as lofty as that that could require so much out of a person so that it would go beyond these initial requirements of the fruit of the Spirit, and particularly keeping love at the forefront of our thought and mind. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and against this, there is no law. Against this, there is no law. I don't think that there are any times when these things aren't required of us. There can't be anything that would say, now, okay, now we have a law. Now, in this area, you, you should not practice temperance anymore. That would just be wrong to practice temperance. Or it'd be wrong to practice faith. Or it'd be wrong to practice love. There's no law against that. I would say, now, in this case, I don't want you to love or be kind. Or you can be firm and be kind at the same time. Or have faith because I'd rather you have doubt or have hate in your life. Well, that, that can never be. There's no law against these. But you see, they're more than a law, because if it's just a law, you can always invent another law that's higher than that law. There's a summing up aspect to them, which is what we're seeing in these passages. Okay, then if we'll jump over to James chapter 2. James 2, the first seven verses talking about the various types of people that come into their synagogal congregation here among the saints, some rich, some poor. Hasn't the Lord chosen the poor of this world who are rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those that love him? But you've despised the poor. You practice deference toward the rich, and they're the ones that oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. And they make you or they attempt to make you blaspheme that worthy name by which you're called. So verse 8, uh, if ye fulfill the royal law, or it could be translated the sovereign law, if ye fulfill the royal or sovereign law according to the scripture, thou, sh <clears throat> thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Well, James does go on to tell us what his royal law is. And what a name to give a law. A royal law. Why, is it, why does he call it a royal law? Well, I'll give you two suggestions. Why he calls it a royal law. Probably he means that it's supreme among the laws. It's the king of laws. And all other laws come underneath it. But it is an interesting and beautiful way of describing love as a royal law. If you're royal, that expresses kingship, that expresses you're the tops, and everything else is a servant under you. Everything else works its way in itself out underneath your supervision and your government and your control. And or the second meaning, and it may just be an additional meaning, uh, where he might think of this as Christ's law, and because Christ is king, then his laws are royal proclamations. See, Jesus is stressed as king in the New Testament. And so he may mean that because Christ is king, then all his laws are royal proclamations. I'm much more in favor of the first of those two, and I'll tell you why. 
um, because James only mentions the name of Jesus, I think, twice, chapter 1, 1, chapter 2, 1. He only mentions the name of Jesus Christ a couple of times. And he never stresses the kingship of Christ in his epistles. So he's going to be assuming that you have already learned a lot of other things in Christian doctrine to, to speak of and to think of in your thought patterns, uh, Christ being king. It's not like it's a theme of James. And I would think, yeah, royal law because Christ is the royal king, the sovereign king of the universe. Uh, he may be the Lord of glory in chapter 2 and verse 1, but that's different than saying that he's king of the universe or king of the world. Uh, kingship, the kingship of Christ, I think, is much more an Old Testament teaching and the book of Revelation teaching than it is anywhere in the epistles. And you'll find it in the Gospels as well. But it's something that's certainly not found that often. I mean, it is found, but I'm saying it's not found that often in the epistles, James being one of those epistles. So I would lean much more heavily in favor of the first meaning that, that the royal law is called that because it's supreme. It's the king of all the laws. It's the king of all the laws. And so you would entitle it the royal law. Okay, then I've already given you Matthew 7, 12, and 1 Timothy 1, 5. Let me give you two interesting quotations from some early church writers. First, from the early writer Philip, Philippi, or Philippi. Not the city, but a man. Early church writer. Here's what he had to say. By its very nature... Love is the duty which, when discharged, is not discharged. Since he does not truly love who loves for the sake of ceasing from loving. And in order to relieve himself from the duty of love. This message will be continued.